Wir haben heute Morgen uns äh, in erster Linie mit äh, dem Kulturfilm und der, seiner Entwicklung und seiner Rezeption und der Auseinandersetzung mit ihm, der wissenschaftlichen Auseinandersetzung mit ihm in Deutschland beschäftigt. Äh, Herr Stenzler hat zu Beginn der Tagung gefragt, ob es einen deutschen Sonderweg gibt. Wir haben die Frage offen gelassen und da, wir haben gut daran getan, denn wir wollen uns heute Nachmittag äh, über die Grenzen hinaus bewegen. Wir wollen nach Frankreich schauen, wir wollen nach Russland schauen, wir wollen fragen, ob es internationale Konventionen des Kulturfilms gab, gab oder nicht, oder andersrum gefragt, ob die babylonische Gefangenschaft an den nationalen Grenzen Halt machte oder ob sie ein kontinentales Phänomen gewesen ist. Und als ersten Redner begrüße ich jetzt Herrn Thomas Elsässer. Thomas Elsässer ist Professor für Filmwissenschaft an der Universität Amsterdam und hat sich insbesondere mit dem neuen deutschen Kino und mit Fassbinder beschäftigt. Und äh, deswegen freue ich mich besonders, ihn einleiten zu können, weil wir gerade einen Fassbinderzyklus auf Arte zeigen. Herr Elsässer, Sie haben das Wort. Ich danke, ähm, muss aber gleich hinzusagen, dass mein Vortrag auf Englisch äh, stattfinden wird. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Zimmermann and Dr. Hoffmann for inviting me to speak today. Uh, I came to this DFG project very late, relatively late, and essentially as an outsider, and I still consider myself an outsider because I'm not a specialist of uh, the documentary film. Furthermore, for reasons of time, but also for reasons of accessibility, uh, I have not been able to see as much of the, the German material as I ideally would have liked, uh, and I have not had the occasion to re-see any of the material that I saw. This is not a comment on the coordinators of the DFG research project. On the contrary, I was very well received and was given generous access on site to the video collection of the House des Dokumentarfilms in Stuttgart. But it is more a way of accounting to myself for why I was doing it in the first place. In other words, why was I uh, in, uh, accepting the invitation? And it had a lot to do with the fact that I wanted to learn about a subject that I knew I knew far too little about. But it was also, it's also a way of accounting for the various degrees of irritation, of restlessness, and even frustration that I felt within me when thinking about the topic of the documentary styles of the late 20s or 30s, uh, which uh, is reflected in uh, my paper because I think the irritation had to do with my desire at a certain point to see many more of the films, especially from the 30s, and my increasingly baffled fascination with them. The restlessness came from not being able to understand at some level what they were about, in the sense of what their audiences would have made of them and what I can make of them now. The frustration finally, the frustration part of it, finally, but perhaps unfairly, focus on the best known and certainly the most trenchant and intelligent audiovisual essay so far made on Nazi documentaries, Hartmut Bitomsky's Deutschlandbilder from 1983 that uh, Herr Zimmermann already mentioned in passing. In fact, for quite a long time, I wanted my paper to be solely about the Bitomsky film. I wanted to enter into a dialogue with what I find so brilliant but also so brutal about this film essay. At the last minute, I pulled back from the brink, but what has remained in, uh, in the sense, uh, because of Deutschland Bilder, is uh, that I have to approach my topic in a very roundabout way. And if you're wondering what the missing centre uh, of this paper is, it is Bitomsky's film. And um, I've addressed Bitomsky's film the last third of my paper, but I already know for time constraints I probably won't get to that part. <coughs> I've been asked to address the question of style. Style in cinema, according to a textbook authority such as David Bordwell, is the patterned, consistent, and significant use of filmic techniques. This may not be the only useful definition of style in documentary, but it is a starting point, except that for my purposes I would add that style should also be defined as the relation of technical possibilities to technical constraints in a given historical context, whereby technical constraints are not only technical constraints in the narrow sense, but also the constraints of production, which include um, some of the, the features of uh, uh, the state intervention or the state sponsorship. I'll come back to that later. So for me, style as a working definition is the relation of technical possibilities to technical constraints in a given historical context. 
for reasons that have to do with the fact that we are talking about documentaries, I'm talking about documentaries in the 30s, but also for reasons of method, I'm deliberately not linking style at this stage to political ideology, be it socialist or fascist, nor am I concerned with the so-called ideology of the real. What does this leave me with, once I exclude those? If we take technical constraints of documentary filmmaking in the early 30s and assess the te technical possibilities immediately after the coming of sound, then some of the more significant stylistic variables would have to be something like this. First, the absence or availability of synchronized sound in a given film. For instance, with it, without sync sound, it is hard to do location interviews. One of the reasons why Arthur Elton and Edgar Anstey's 1936 housing pro problems uh, made for the Gas Council of Great Britain is such a classic is that uh, it was one of the first to have interior shots and sync sound interviews, notably the famous story of how the housewife killed a rat with a broom. Um, I will try, I will try, um, but uh, I'm afraid I've got a few things to... Uh, uh, get through, and I also have some video extracts, so that'll give you relief from my uh, torrent of words. Um, second, so fir first, first characteristic is synchronized sound, and what uh, what happens with sound would be the technical uh, parameter. Second, the presence of static, heavyweight, 35 millimeter camera equipment, usually again too big for interior shots or indoor filming. And, on the other hand, the availability of wind-up portable 35mm cameras with small magazines. And thirdly, the financial constraints, conditioning production, when compared to industry standard feature filmmaking of the period, and thus the involvement of sponsors, be they industrial or political. Um, den ersten Ausschnitt, bitte. Uh, this is to illustrate uh, what I was saying about the equipment. It's from a program on documentary with an extract from Housing Problems. Der Präsentator hier heißt Gavin Lambert, selbst ein bekannter Filmemacher. Ja, das ist es. Ich möchte Sie auch allein auf die Schatten hinweisen, die hier im Bild erscheinen. Just the shadows in the, uh, in the background is what I'm, what I'm interested in. Uh, danke. Uh, kann ich jetzt das Nummer zwei gleich hinterher haben? Ich möchte es kontrastieren. I want to contrast this to uh, an excerpt from a film from 1927 made by Paul Wolf in Frankfurt, which has nothing to do with poverty, and has nothing to do with expressionism, quite the contrary. Uh, it has to do with uh, modern uh, living. Uh, and you see the same shadows. See here? The same shadows. That gives you some indication of the difficulties of lighting a cramped interior space. And there to talk about the influence of expressionism would really be precisely not seeing the technical conditions under which uh, documentary filmmaking took place at that particular point in time. Uh, danke. In many countries, um, documentary of either conservative or left-wing persuasion remained, and not only for political reasons, a poor cinema, a state of affairs in later decades dignified with the term independent cinema. To read the biographies of Para Lorenz, Walter Ruttmann, and Joris Evans is to realize that despite their political divergences, there was one thing all three had in common, that uh, permanent struggle with the budget. The textbooks tell us that there are broadly four phases of documentary as a distinct genre with a history, canonized authors, and canonized masterpieces. The first is the Robert Fla Flaherty, John Grierson phase, uh, which Gavin Lambert here uh, talked about as well, which, which lasted uh, from the mid-twenties broadly to the late thirties. It was predominantly left-wing, or at any rate, concerned with social issues arising from the Great Crash and the Depression, thematizing in America rural poverty, uh, industrialization and advocating in all cases state decreed modernization. The documentary was considered left wing had, it seems to me, to do with the fact that the governments of Germany, Russia and Britain in the late twenties, and those of the United States and France in the th early thirties were broadly socialist, liberal or left of center in their politics. And all were concerned with the issues of uh, the transformation of essentially uh, rural, in some sense, agrarian societies into modern industrial societies. 
The exception, uh, but only half an exception, is Italy, and then, of course, Germany from 1933 onwards, turning to the right. But even in Germany, especially in Germany, I would say the social issues remained often the same, and so did the fact that the progressive solutions advocated were those also pursued by the state. We have a very specific model in almost all those films, which is before and after. And therefore, the question that already came up this morning, how do we define progress at that particular time, and thereby how do we, do we define avant-garde, is very much apropos. It's precisely around um, uh, what I would consider to be a look again at uh, the, the policies of all these countries in, in Europe, including in America, in the early 30s. Almost everywhere, the state remained the largest, though by no means the only funder and sponsor of documentaries. Chief amongst them, the British documentary movement, unthinkable without the Empire Marketing Board, the Ceylon Tea Board, the General Post Office Unit, later called the Crown Film Unit, uh, the British Commercial Gas Association. In, um, in the United States, you have the National Film and Photo League, a political uh, party organization, basically, the American Institute of Planners, and the Resettlement Agency, most famously, which, as you probably know, had to be disbanded because Congress voted it as unconstitutional. Beside the state, or through the state, it was, for, ab above all, industrial and commercial interests and lobby groups which sponsored documentaries. And even Flatus Nanook of the North was partly funded by a firm of fur traders, Révillon Frères. The exception, perhaps, is Germany, or rather, um, I'm, I'm curious to find out more about this, and I heard a little bit uh, this morning, you had UFA very much involved in producing uh, non-fiction material, uh, and, of course, the constraints or the, the, the conditions of possibility in Germany had a lot to do with legislation, tax concessions, and programming policy. But even under, uh, in Nazi Germany, as we know, a plethora of government agencies were involved in funding, sponsoring, and commissioning those films. Uh, regional offices of the NSDAP, uh, Kraft durch Freude, the Propaganda Ministry, uh, Schönheiter Arbeit, various other organizations all involved in uh, this, this work. The close alliance of documentary with the state prepared the second phase, beginning with the outbreak of World War II, when, I quote Charles Musser, documentary played a crucial propaganda role on both sides of the conflict. During the 30s and 40s, documentary increasingly became a form that reached and influenced mass audiences for purposes beyond entertainment and art. He means propaganda, mobilization, indoctrination, but uh, uh, I think we would uh, have to uh, uh, extend his argument backwards and see and look again at all the non-theatrical, I would say non-theatrical uses of cinema. Far too little is known about uh, the art, or at least uh, in some, some quarters about the medical uses, which were never used in culture film, but actually stayed within institutions and so on many, many institutions that used film for training purposes, for documentation, and, and even for uh, uh, jubilees and so on um, that we haven't really uh, looked at and I think belong also to the, uh, the, the non-fiction non genre. The third phase, and I'll be very brief about this, uh, did only begin in the 1960s, uh, according to the textbooks with the rise of cinema verite, direct cinema, and so on. Um, if I take uh, a classic writer on documentaries from the Anglo-American world, Bill Nichols, uh, in his widely influential books on documentary, Ideology and the Image, Blurred Boundaries and Representing Reality, uh, Nichols elaborates a classification system of four major styles. The direct address style of the Grierson tradition, the cinema veritas style of, style of capturing the moment, the interview style, and finally the self-reflexive style. Nichols calls them different voices of documentary, which I think is quite a very interesting term, but he too has arranged them broadly in chronological order, understanding the history of the documentary as either a dialectic of opposites or the success successive swings of the pendulum from the directly intervening voice to the more and more muted and implied uh, voice of uh, other styles. Nick Nichols' account contrasts with an oldest type of history of documentary, that, for instance, of Eric Barnow, who basically tells the story of pioneers, giving us the baton relay story of great men, starting with Flirty, Grierson, Jennings, through to Riefenstahl and Frank Capra, all the way to Fred Wiseman, the Maisley's brothers, and Pennebaker, and ending with Marcel Ophüls, uh, John Alpert, and Michael Moore. His chapters are entitled, interestingly enough, Prophet, Explorer, Reporter, Painter, 
advocate, bugler, prosecutor, poet, chronicler, promoter, observer, catalyst, guerrilla fighter. In other words, Barr now sees the history of documentary as a kind of roll call of social roles, of artistic personas, and of ideological functions that filmmakers successively assume in the public sphere, that is social life, the everyday political uh, struggle, and radical alternatives. In schemes such as uh, either Nichols or Barnow's, the task of writing the history of German documentary in an international context, which is what I'm partly addressing, would then come down to inserting the different decades of German documentary production into these and possibly other uh, histories of key figures, leading, uh, leading to a new, hopefully, categorization and uh, new generic classifications. On the face of it, Nichols' system of voices would make it difficult to place the German tradition, either in the 20th, 20 variant of the Kulturfilm or in the 1930s incarnation of the home front morale booster and 1940s wartime propaganda film. They all fall broadly under the first direct address mode, but as I said, uh, one has to factor in the technical uh, issues around the direct address mode and not just the ideological and political factors or even the aesthetic ones. In such a scheme, for instance, the culture film uh, would seem too diverse and heterogeneous, topics too varied, the styles too unpredictable, the genres ranging far too widely across the spectrum of instruction and education, popular science and nature, visual et ethnography and exotic travelogues to uh, allow voice or this uh, direct address mode uh, to cover them all. Barnow's more personalized author uh, centered approach would at least cut down some of the confusing proliferation, but it would leave out far too much of the near anonymous output, although I'm glad to hear that the, uh, the output is getting less and less anonymous as more people work on it. The line for Germany would start off as left-wing and poetic, with Walter Ruttmann, Paul Wolf, Ella Bergmann, Michels, and Wilfried Basse, then become primarily right-wing, and of course, interesting enough, with some of the same names, Walter Ruttmann, Wilfried Basse, uh, Kurt Ertl, uh, Willi Zielke and Karl Junghans, culminating in Leni Riefenstahl uh, before the wartime propaganda documentaries such as Feldzug in Polen, metamorphosed into anti-Semitic agitation in the figure of Fritz Hippler, mentioned this morning, but definitely, if you're having an author-centered approach, uh, a key figure in every sense of the word. I'll now skip... Uh, and you see, I, I do actually uh, have some things that I can also skip. Uh, an extract from Wilfried Basse, uh, which I think is something between the ethnographic, it's Deutschland, uh, gestern, von, uh, gestern und heute, 19, what's it, 1936? Well, he worked on it for so long, it's difficult to know exactly where or how to date it. Uh, something between the ethnographic and the lyrical, part nostalgic, but also part surrealist. And I've ch chosen a small extract which shows that rather surrealist aspect, but with a very distinct authorial signature. Coming as I do to the topic of German documentary as a film historian primarily of early cinema in uh, and uh, maybe of Weimar mainstream genre and art cinema, my first impulse is to be mindful of some of the criteria of the so-called new film history, which have emerged, as you know, mainly around the study of early cinema up to 1918. Among these criteria are, for instance, such commonplaces as that film history is more than the history of individual films, meaning that it is not, not only the baton relay of great masters, passing on the torch of stylistic innovation, or even the working of the Hegelian world spirit, uh, dialectically proceeding across alternation uh, to opposite or complementary styles. Given that films on this account are only one kind of evidence for film history, the question arises, also for our topic, uh, which other discourses, those of the makers, those of reception, those of the trade press, or those of the state, should one privilege and which constraints, the technological ones, the financial ones, the sponsorship, the censorship, the tax incentives, and so on, should one factor in as determinants for a filmmaker's specific choices and options? Thirdly, film style on this uh, new film history criterion list, film style is not only the means of self-expression of creative individuals whose significance would lie in its innovative or uh, uh, out, uh, exceptional or avant-garde use, Style can also be a way uh, the technique becomes an accepted, naturalized, invisible practice among a group of professionals. In other words, technique is style 
in that sense, when it becomes a sort of norm. If one applied these criteria to the history of documentary, then a dominant, that is, normative stylistic features that emerge from the technical constraints I have listed above for the period that I'm dealing with, the 1930s, would be something like this. First of all, and most crucially, the montage style, characterized by discontinuity and juxtaposition. Whether we call it influenced by Soviet filmmakers, a style known in the German trade as Russensalat, Russian salad, or whether we see it merely as a consequence of the newly available portable Kinamo, IMO, and debris cameras, whose wind-up mechanism only allowed for relatively short takes at a time, the fact is that mon montage is perhaps the most distinctive stylistic feature for the period, but is, uh, is one within which a filmmaker nonetheless may have had a wide scope for differentiation. Um, Bitte die nächsten zwei Extrakte, aber Sie müssen das Band etwas vorziehen. Ja, hier sehen Sie die Schatten nochmal. Okay, jetzt. Das ist gut. Nee, nee, das ist es. Hier hätten Sie ein, ein Beispiel eines deutschen Films, schön hat der Arbeit äh, sehr stark Montageprinzipien benutzt. Okay, äh, danke. Das lasse ich jetzt ist von, äh, als, als Gegenbeispiel, als komplementäres Beispiel äh, Metall des Himmels äh, von Ruttmann. Flaherty, uh, Flaherty is the land, um, by contrast, has beautiful panoramic shots, long takes of the land and the landscape, of the dust storms, uh, presumably taking with heavy equipment, um, but nonetheless outdoors. But as soon as people are in the picture, the takes become shorter and the style approaches montage rather than continuity editing. Uh, with the odd, as, and I'll show you a sequence of that, with the odd and often rather unconvincing attempt at continuity editing and thereby uh, attempt at eyeline matches between a group shot or a portrait shot and a landscape pan, uh, the issue we had this morning around Leni Riefenstahl, namely whether she was using uh, techniques for, of the feature film for uh, documentaries, for her documentaries. I think here, a very good example of Flaherty doing exactly the same thing. The second point uh, uh, here would, would be, this is on uh, what kind of stylistic choices there, there were apart from montage. We usually have an external voiceover commentary in the form of a narration that editorializes what we see. But even there, one can, can identify very different styles. Um, I, again, I wanted to show something, but I may, may not have time. Thirdly, the music, uh, mostly specially composed, plays a key role in generating continuity and marking different segments, especially for the authored uh, document, just to which we associate now often the name avant-garde, I would say the, the music, or the music, musical form, both the music that we hear, but also the musical form, as a, as a principle of organization becomes crucial. I just want to name uh, the importance in America of Virgil Thompson, in Britain of Benjamin Britten and in Germany of Herbert Wind as those key composers involved in the documentary uh, style of their respective countries. Fourthly, uh, scenes involving human protagonists or human action uh, always invariably is staged and directed. Um, I'll, I'll skip the example now because we're really running out of time. Um, some of these features are strangely alien to us, as well as all too familiar. And I think it's this uh, alien, this, this, this attempt to see them again as unfamiliar that we have to train ourselves at. Uh, we may have to guard, I would argue, interpreting a particular feature of uh, a given film, um, for instance, that the, the fact that the actions are staged according to our own standards or, for instance, that the, the voice is editorializing. Uh, at one point, Bitomsky, in his film, uh, Deutschland Bilder, observes that Nazi documentaries show very little curiosity, he says, Neugier is the word he uses, in the way they approach a given subject. Even on topics that are factual or technical, the commentary already seems to know what's happening. Um, I have a very beautiful extract, but uh, again, I'll, I'll leave that out. But my question to, to Potomsky would be, does this observation about the lack of curiosity actually make sense? 
especially if it's meant as a criticism. Given the constraints of the fixed camera, the staging of the scene, and the post-synchronized scripted commentary, the evidentiary status of the image is a different one from what it would be with today's technical possibilities, and indeed it would be for the audience at the time. What for me becomes fascinating instead is the drama of the different techniques, slow motion, close-up, x-rays, some of the things that uh, Zimmermann talked about this morning, the, di the drama of the different techniques uh, themselves, the way in which the image seeks, escapes or exceeds the commentary through its techniques. In other words, a completely different drama uh, than what we usually uh, look out for when we have a primarily uh, political or ideological uh, approach or when we compare them to um, especially cinema verite. You know, this, this question about are these films showing any Neugier I think comes from an, uh, a kind of norm that uh, derives from, from a different uh, phase of uh, docu -film, documentary filmmaking. At other times what attracts attention is the striking or felicitous word music image combinations in a given film style. Again I have two examples uh, no, I can't use them. One is from Mensch Sohn Blech, 1938, where the commentary is actually rhymed, and I wanted to contrast that with Nightmare, with the famous Orden poem, uh, also from 1936. Uh, so there you have two ways in which uh, even that uh, editorializing commentary is actually worked into the film in very specific, but also uh, very uh, comparable ways, uh, both in German and in uh, uh, English film, British films from the 30s. Sometimes it is instructive to assess a given documentary practice not in relation to what doc documentary uh, mode precedes or follows it in chronological time or to what it co compares, but instead to compare the documentary style with the industrial feature film production uh, uh, of the same period and the norms that, that it uh, uh, deploys or indeed of the still photography of the time. It is revealing to contrast, for instance, again, Flaherty's The Land, with its poor southern migrants eking out an existence on roadside resting stops on the way to the orange groves of California, and compare uh, this film to uh, the farm ad administration pictures of Margaret Bourke White, uh, Dorothea Lange, Walter Evans, or indeed, most famously, to John Ford's Grapes of Wrath. What it shows, especially the comparison of the land with Grapes of Wrath, what it shows is not necessarily that Flaherty was a lesser director than Ford, though he probably was, but also that the technical and financial means, including um, the, uh, the human means available to Ford, were immeasurably superior to those of Flaherty, and it shows. But what also shows is that Ford, beholden only to Zanuck and the post, of, uh, the post office, the box office, <laughs> uh, beholden only to Zanuck and the box office, is politically a good, more, good deal more radical than Flaherty, beholden to governmental policy and his sponsors. Here I now had a, an extract from Grapes of Wrath. See, it goes very well. I just uh, hint at them and you know what I'm referring to. A slightly different case of the relation between documentary and feature film might be Joris Evans' film from 1937, Spanish Earth. In many ways, looked at from today's practice, this could be seen as a classic precursor of the television archive compilation film of the genre for which the BBC's World at War, with Laurence Olivier uh, speaking the commentary, became famous in the 1980s. Spanish Earth 2 has a post-synchronized, carefully scripted commentary read by a famous person. The film was shot in Spain over a considerable period of time by several cameramen, Evans himself, John Ferner, with additional newsreel footage by Roman Carmen. Then it was shipped to New York, where Evans and Helen von Dongen edited it with a commentary spoken by none other than Ernest Hemingway, sounding remarkably uh, like the young Henry Fonda from Grapes of Wrath. But as late as 1980, a critic, a German critic, in a tribute to Evans, wrote about Spanish Earth the following. Mark Blitzstein and Virgil Thompson composed the music. Evans compiled the sounds, orienting himself after his impressions from Spain. Thus the bombardment sounds are not from the actual sites of the hits, but taken from a feature film, the earthquake sounds of Willard van Dyck's San Francisco of 1936, additionally altered and synthesized by Evans. The images, too, were recorded in discontinuity, 
the planes which are supposed to drop bombs on the village were shot on a different day from the shots of the village itself. And within the bombing raids, there is a short sequence seen from the perspective of the bombing shoot of the plane, a shot over which Evans and Van Dongen got into an argument. But when we watch the film, all these disparate elements fuse into a single perception. We experience an authenticity which is genuine, even though it is the result of Evans' artistically constructed authenticity. Evans calls his montage style discreet and imperceptible. The horrors of war are to be communicated indirectly via the movements and faces of the people. The commentary doesn't say those bloody fascists did this, but three Junkers passed overhead. In other words, no propaganda. This is a quote from Hans Helmut Prinzler. Um, I was now going to show you the extract that Prinzler is referring to, but again, uh, uh, you have to take my word for it. I must say, I find this argument of authenticity a little disingenuous. I'm more reminded of a Johnny Weissmuller action film where Tarzan fights with a lion or a tiger, but for obvious reasons, you never get to see the two of them in the same shot. André Bazin, a few years later, would base his preference for the long take and the composition in depth on just such an irritation with the montage style of the 1940s and 50s wildlife documentaries. Note, for instance, now this I'm referring to the sequence, note, for instance, in the sequence from Spanish Earth, the two dead boys in the sequence. Not only is there no proof that it's the same two we saw out on the street, which is what the commentary claims, uh, but they are clearly playing dead. It's a stage scene. There are indeed some real corpses in Spanish earth, but they are not of the loyalists and nor of Franco's men. We see Italian mercenaries dead, disfigured, with flies on their blood-soaked faces, uh, taken from newsreel footage. So that even in a civil war, it would seem the only real dead that can be shown are of an enemy, a foreign enemy dead. For Evans, editing the film in the United States was a matter of finance and funding. But like other films such as Spain in Flames or Heart of Spain, it was also part of the film's propaganda purpose to have it uh, edited in the United States with Hemingway, namely to rally public opinion and help break American non-intervention policy and the arms embargo imposed by Congress. On the other side, a pro-Franco Spain film like Carl Jung Junghans's Die Geisel der Menschheit got into trouble in Germany because Goebbels considered it too communist. Bypassing the director, the material was re-edited, given a new commentary, and retitled Helden in Spanien. It reached the cinemas only after the Civil War was over in 1938. As a montage and compilation film, however, Junghans's film appears to observe much the same stylistic norms as even Spanish Earth, and one might add, much the same vulnerability to propagandist manipulation in the editing room. And, of course, the most brilliant and most awful example of that is Fritz Hippler's Der Ewige Jude and the heterogeneity of the material that he's able to, to use in that film. What seems worth retaining from my list of criteria typical of the new film history for the documentary is perhaps above all the one that film history ought to be able to explain or account for the fundamental discontinuities as well as the continuities. I want to posit, in other words, the hypothesis of strangeness or the sense of otherness of the documentaries of the 1930s, in spite of so many of them looking so familiar in, and in spite of them being, in some cases, canonical classics of the genre, coming with, coming with the right or left political credentials. If Spanish Earth looks so familiar, it is partly because, like non-fiction television today, uh, Evans has edited his footage according to the iron necessity to turn images, whatever their provenance or whatever their original context, into a single story, into a coherent narrative. But what today is the law of commercial television was in Evans's case also a style born out of technical and financial necessity supporting a specific political propagandist purpose. This, I think, is what makes the film a classic to this day, not its honesty, not its curiosity, not its authenticity. I think I'll probably run out of time. Oh, are you giving me five more minutes? Okay. Uh, paradoxically, it is the overt propagandist function of so much politically progressive documentary in the 1930s, which is one of the main reasons why I think an ideological or propaganda classification may not be the first or the most useful interpretation uh, to, a, to a given uh, corpus. It ends up being both tautological and ahistorical. 
But how, one would have to ask, can we read and analyze them? A discussion about the kinds of classification and modes of interpretation become especially pertinent for anyone trying to write the history of German documentary film, not least because so many of the films still await even the most rudimentary sort of categorization and classification, and because there are, until now, so few canonical works apart from Walter Ruttmann or Leni Riefenstahl or Fritz Hipplers. While the vast masses of films are still kept under lock and key, sometimes as political poison. And I want to end up on a, on, uh, a quote from Bitomsky, um, which starts my last, last part, of our, I'll leave it there. As Bitomsky says at one point in his film, the images of Nazi documentaries are like hostages. They have to be bought free with a ransom. Again, echoes of the Babylonian imprisonment. And once more, the images of docu Nazi documentaries are like hostages. They have to be bought free with ransom. The question then becomes, why pay this ransom and to whom? And Bitomsky, again, as acute as ever, answers, and I quote, the films are treated as documents, but they are interrogated as if they were double agents that had come in from the cold in order to be debriefed. The images have to stand for the Nazi regime, and at the same time, they have to be called into the dock as witnesses against the regime. Bilder, Dokumente, die gegen sich selbst aussagen müssen. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs>